it's um, quite an honor and a privilege to be uh, here with all of you from all over the world. Um, me sitting here, it's eight o'clock in Hanoi. It's been quite a hot day, um, but we had some rain, so not quite as hot as it has. Um, I just thought I'd give you a little bit of background from, I guess, where I've come from. Um, I did a secondary teaching degree in drama and English, but worked in theatre and education and community theatre at the beginning of my career. So a lot of it was focused around um, social justice and kind of community issues, a lot of community awareness kind of projects that we worked on. And the theatre and education program that I worked on worked in schools and community groups, they were detention centres and you name it, but cross-curriculum and it was all learning by do doing. So encouraging uh, mostly young people to develop uh, their ideas and their voice and give them a kind of positive uh, learning experience. Um, we often worked with low achievers and um, or kind of those who were deemed non-academic. Uh, and I think we often came up that a lot of the teachers that we worked with were surprised at the results that came out of um, with these kids that, you know, actually did meet the learning objectives and did engage and uh, develop their skills in this kind of context, whereas in the traditional classroom, that wasn't happening. I've been living and um, working in Vietnam for almost 16 years. Um, I came over here for a whole lot of different reasons and, and stayed. Um, just to give you a bit of background in terms of the education system here, it's very exam oriented. The last few years of high school are almost completely devoted to the university entry exam, which is, I can say here, um, not very helpful. Um, you have to wrote, learn a lot of information that you'll probably never learn again. But if you don't go through that system, it's almost impossible to pass. So it's quite um, a restricted kind of system. There's a lot of pressure for teachers to follow the course book um, and to maintain a very traditional classroom. So there's not a lot of, well, there hasn't been traditionally a lot of experimentation, exploration, or doing different kinds of things. But that is changing. So the project that uh, John was talking about, um, I've done quite a lot of teacher training here. Um, I've done a lot of methodology, a lot of language proficiency, and the project that we worked on was specifically about project-based learning. And we worked with Vietnamese primary teachers, secondary teachers, and high school teachers, um, introducing climate action through project-based learning in an ELT classroom. So the other thing I guess I should say is that for some, some of you who are working in different countries, um, other than the UK, I imagine you will have similar class sizes that, that we have here, which that is usually around 40, but can be up to 45. So they're big, big classrooms, a lot of kids, a lot of disinterested. So for the teachers, it's a learning curve to adapt course book material. It's a learning curve to do anything that's a little bit more physical or requires moving around because of the limitations of the classrooms that they have. Um, getting them to find links between the course book and climate related issues is also a challenge. But I mean, you're, I mean, most of you, you're all here. So I assume that you're kind of interested in the topic and you know that everything that we do, everything that we use, everything that we have has some kind of impact on, on um, the environment. So it's not that hard to find a link in the way, um, in, in the content of a course book. So uh, there's a couple of projects that I'll talk about a little bit later that I hope will give you a kind of idea about that. Um, so I think maybe I should now, I'll share my screen. I've got a bit of a PowerPoint, hopefully take through the process. 
um, a bit more about project-based learning and then some of the projects that we've worked on. So let me share my screen. Okay, a familiar um, message, I'm sure. For everybody, reduce, reuse, recycle. And that was one that was really popular uh, in the pro uh, PBL project last year. So um, why PBL? Well, for me, the teachers in Vietnam, maybe it's the same in your classrooms, uh, they're often complaining or certainly voicing the fact that their students lack motivation, they don't get engaged, they, you know, complain things are boring. Um, and a lot here, particularly in schools outside of the capital um, or capitals um, uh, or big cities, they don't see the point of learning. Well, then there's not a lot of um, opportunities to use the language. They can't see how it might be useful to them in the future. So, and you've got 45 students in the classroom and you can't give them all um, a lot of attention in one 45 minute class. So it's a challenge. Um, but one of the things that, that I guess I found when I was doing theatre and education, and I've certainly found in project-based learning, that low achievers um, usually perform better. They enjoy it, they're motivated, they want to learn, and they succeed. Um, and reach or at least get a, fit, a lot closer to achieving the learning objectives um, of the kind of projects or close classes that um, have been set. So what actually is PBL? It's basically learning by doing. Um, and it's there's a number of things that really have to be met in order to uh, make it a project-based learning and not just a, a task-based thing. So it does need to be based on on something meaningful to the students. So it's um, a real life, um, real world problem or issue, something that relates to the students as well. It has to work towards um, an outcome at the end. Uh, it's very student-centered which means it requires the teacher to take a back seat in many ways, but always kind of um, in voting terms, have a hand on the tiller. Um, and it's done over a period of time. One of the things that Vietnamese teachers found quite difficult was that they have a project at the end of every unit, which is meant to be done in a 45 minute uh, class but it's only really one part of the class. So students can't achieve a meaningful project. To do PBL successfully, it needs to be run over a number of lessons, um, ideally three or four, maybe over three or four weeks. It could even run for a whole term or a whole year, uh, depending on what the project is. So it's really important that it has that time built in for the students to be able to have input, develop in their ideas, reflect, um, further develop, and then end, uh, come up with their end product, whatever that might happen to be. Um, it's very active learning. Um, and yes, there is this final product. And that can take the form of many things. I mean, we've had um, students who have done an art exhibition, uh, posters, they can organise an event. There's a multitude of things that they can do. Um, and I'll go on. So, but why use it? I mean, I would say because it's a great tool in the classroom. You get active engagement. You've got clear learning outcomes that the students understand from the beginning and buy into, they, they um, have to be part of the decision making, making so therefore they are motivated. Um, there's relevance to them, uh, not just uh, something that's happening in another country or another city, it's something that's happening with them where they are, what they're doing. 
um, there's all of the great um, skills of working together, using you know, cross, um, cross curriculum and the four skills and speaking and reading and listening and, and uh, I've left one out but I can't think what it is. Um, so the 20, 21st century skills that, that students by the time they get to the end of high school if they're going out to university and into the workforce must have to succeed um, today. Uh, and as I said, yeah, the four skills. And they're working on authentic tasks. And there are many ways that we can bring those to authentic material rather than just looking at a course book, which they feel often is outdated, not relevant to them. Um, so it's just a speed lesson on how to introduce PBL. Uh, and climate action into the classroom. The most important thing about PBL is that the students are part of the decision making. You need to design a project or introduce the idea of a project that's going to be something that they are interested in, that's relevant to them and affects them. It doesn't have to be done with a course book, but if you have one and a bit of pressure to get through it, by all means, use your curriculum and build a project, use what's in it to feed into the project. Um, I think another really valuable thing is to look at what else is happening in your area. So if you've got uh, climate action organisations or there are issues, the councils are doing something, um, or there's been um, newspaper articles about something, use that as a way into the topic. Um, if you uh, have a school that's got extracurricular clubs or themes or after school programs, maybe what they're doing in that program could also feed into what you're doing in your English class. Maybe it gives the students time to perhaps rehearse if they're doing some kind of performance that kind of thing. Um, and uh, one of the things that was fantastic that we saw last year on this um, project that we worked on was a number of teachers worked together. And so uh, in one primary school, there were five teachers, uh, no, sorry, four uh, ELT teachers who worked together to develop a program for their grade fours. And that was incredibly effective. Um, they can also and that they could give feedback and support, um, and particularly if it's your first time, it's really helpful to have that. Um, challenges and solutions. Okay. Um, I mentioned the word buy-in before, and I think this is really critical. If the students aren't part of the process at the very beginning, in deciding the form and the shape of the project, it's not, it's going to be much harder to make it succeed. They have to share in the decision making. They have to feel that they have ownership and that it's not the teacher saying, you must do this. This is something that you've worked together to create the parameters for and that everybody has input into. It's also will break if you can. Uh, as I mentioned before, the school colleagues, but also the school administration. Um, I, I, uh, there's an example of one of the projects that um, one of the teachers worked on last year. She works in a one high school, and uh, it's a pretty state. A lot of older teachers who were not um, interested in straying away from traditional methods. They were very sceptical about what they would... Well, in fact, they were more than sceptical. They didn't approve of what you was doing. Uh, they complained at every opportunity they had. If the class was a bit noisy, uh, to the point where they actually complained to her school principal, who fortunately um, was absolutely supportive and she was able to continue and... Um, and finished the project and the, the end result was great. Like kids did some amazing things. Um, but sometimes, you know, they can be friction depending on kind of I guess education. Um, the other thing that 
that proved to be quite invaluable to a lot of our teachers um, on the projects was you having the parent support, um, not only just from, a, a, I guess, a, a point of supporting and encouraging students in the actual project, but also providing context, uh, contacts that helped uh, develop or provide answers and solutions for the project. Um, that was kind of interesting. Um, and we'll have a look at one of those projects shortly. We don't have time tonight to go into all the uh, steps involved in making a project-based learning project. But one of the things that is important is the driving question. And this is what drives, literally, um, the project. It's what the project's based on. You might have a general topic, but you have a driving question that everything that you do within class, everything that the students do in terms of developing the project should go back to that driving question. So let me show you this. I'm just going to excuse me for one second. Okay, so this is um, one of the projects that we uh, did last year, uh, a serious pollution problem in our area. Uh, the driving question was how can we make our area less polluted? Now, one of the things I think that teachers fear is when they're doing this, that the language objectives of what they need to achieve go out the window, but that's not actually the case. Um, well, it doesn't have to be. Uh, so here you can see the um, language objectives that they had, um, aside from the kind of, I mean, all of them, obviously, um, range related to the aspect of environmental um, issues that they were dealing with. But here they're looking at um, ad adverb clauses of time, communication skills, and then more specifically outlined here, the target language from the lessons. So in this project, um, they realised that the feature um, is quite amazing. Uh, milk cartons are a huge problem in terms of rubbish um, in the school. Uh, Ken had a lot of support from the school principal and community and was able to do a whole school announcement that they were working on this project and they wanted help from the whole school to collect um, uh, milk cartons for them to develop the project. So, uh, the mind rose up. So this was, because I think you remember, um, a grade eight project. Uh, actually, he um, uh, made a kind of small error in that she planned her project but then realised she had to actually submit her delivered project uh, before that. So she ran it as an after-school program, uh, which is pretty dedicated, I think. Uh, grade eights, um, it was done over seven lessons. Um, they also incorporated Earth Day, uh, looking at single-use products, global warming, um, the environmental issues related to animals, and then they, the students did um, presentations about um, and projects about environmental protection, and then they they presented those to the class. Um, a lot of this is again another school that's in a rural area, very initial exposure to English, um, and the students predominantly had a fairly low level of English language skills for for that um, uh, age group. But they achieved an amazing amount, and they got. Oh, sorry, I have this one thousand. This is one thousand seven hundred one something or other cartons they collected, which is incredible. I think um, they also, again, talking about the community, they reached out to um, a recycling company, like on, and were able to. Um, the ones that they didn't use for their projects, 
they actually sent off to be recycled. So it was kind of, it was, there were several problems operating on a case study. And this is one of the, they made all sorts of products that they could use and take home, this being a pencil holder. Um, a lot of the projects, particularly at primary school level, involved lots of arts and crafts as well, but things that they, students could be quite proud of. Um, say no to plastic is um, another uh, project. What should we do with plastic? How do we throw out? Um, oral communication skills should, shouldn't. Um, looking at in vocabulary related to the environment. Uh, this was a really interesting project because it was done outside of the curriculum. But it was just amazing. It was four teachers, as you can see here. Yeah. Three teachers, sorry. Um, they wanted to raise awareness about um, reduce, reduce, recycle, plastic, um, recycling plastic bottles. That was the kind of green action element that they wanted to do. Um, it's a fantastic program. Um, you'll see in a minute, I'll show you some of the materials that they put together for this. Um, they did the life cycle of plastic, what happens to plastic when you throw it out, then they looked at the three R's, um, and then at the end, what with the plastic bottles that they had left, they had this project of making um, wind scanners. Shop, shop, set. So here, they've looked at how long it takes for how long it will, how long all of these pieces of plastic will last, which was kind of amazing and they brought all these things in. So the students went in and dove into their own rubbish bags at home. Uh, but again, got the family involved. And I think that that's a really, and like, particularly with an organisation like this, we're trying to spread the word and raise awareness, not just to the students, but also to the wider community. Um, they did some really nice um, materials. Uh, for the students to work with, and these were created by the teachers. Um, I love this one. They did a whole lot of different um, bins and then all the different things, cards that they set up. Um, and at the, at the end of this course that we did, uh, we actually put together materials, and we'll share that with you at the end, uh, which hopefully, if you have extra other question, questions for me, but um, I did want to go into some more details. <clears throat> Those that uh, resource kit will um, have all the answers for you. And this uh, is a picture of the kids with their wind spinners. And what they ended up doing was hanging them all along the windows in the school. Um, and so they would blow the breeze, but also when the sunlight hit them, you got this kind of rainbow effect of color. And they were, they were pretty fabulous. This, um, Battery project is also an interesting one. This one's I'm showing you kind of pro projects from a really quite wide range of schools. This has been schools. This is a semi-private or private school um, with a, there's a, lots of um, across Vietnam. They have a lot of resources and they have a lot of um, opportunities that perhaps are not available in other schools. Here's our team uh, with their teacher bun. The driving question was, and this was a um, global citizen program, so not part of the ELT course, but uh, run as a, it's, it's a subject area on its own within their curriculum. It uh, follows the sustainable development goals and uh, that. So uh, this one, whilst it wasn't only English, uh, they did mostly use English, communication uh, skills, and a lot of uh, focus on uh, the use of language, persuasion, awareness raising. They did an incredible social media campaign within the school to raise awareness for this project. So the students 
chose this project. Um, and again, this is a good example where the teacher was could guide and had input in, in terms of helping them when they needed it, but also was able to, to step back and let them make their own decisions. Um, one of the, um, they wanted to do something that was meaningful, was centuries are a huge issue. So how do you dispose? So what they did, um, they set up a battery exchange program and they had a concert to raise awareness for it, to encourage the students to bring in their batteries. They got these uh, coconut fibre flower pots and they exchanged five batteries for one flower pot. So there was an incentive. They even built in. These kids are really good marketers. They built in an incentive for people to bring their batteries. Um, and it was a really successful um, campaign. They organised the, uh, the music concert um, and the media campaign. And I um, remember how many batteries, but they did in a very short period of time. Uh, got a whole lot of people uh, in the school aware and interested. And more importantly, they actually had somewhere for these batteries to go. One of the parents, fortunately, um, uh, worked or had a family member work at Samsung um, here who have a battery disposable disposal program. And so the students were able to plug into the disposal system um, and see the Carter Farm um, endpoint for these batteries. So it was a really, really great project. Avoid resources or waste at school. This is another really nice project uh, with a very full program. That's my driving question I was typing in. Ah. Um, oops. Okay. The driving question was what can we do to avoid waste in our school? Um, you can see there the language objectives. This one um, was. Yes. Remind myself here. Um, a lot of. Um, a lot of material, a lot of drama. She's so afraid. Uh, it covered an enormous amount. Um, they did all of the kind of recycling, the life cycle again of plastic, um, a lot of focus on on individual, what individuals can do. Um, and they made some my posters, which you can see here. Um, they worked with their course book and the unit that they had uh, was having a party. And most teachers are going to go, well, most people are going to go, what's, what's having a party got to do with the environment? And the tack that the teacher took was that, well, what are you going to do with all of that donut food and plastic from the party, all the waste? And so it became... Um, a focus on food waste and and plastic, um, single-use plastic, um, what you do with the leftovers. They worked with a local organisation here called the Ed Harvest. Um, it's a spin-off from one in Australia called Oz Harvest, which is a um, preventing food waste organisation. And um, so for them, it wasn't... One, they have waste every, they have a party, they have waste, they can see that. This is an organisation that's working in their country, in their city. So it's not something that's happening in another country, it's something that's happening right on their doorstep. So it's real for them as well. And I think that, that I think it's a really good example about how you can bring an idea into the to the students' lives that they can really relate to. I can stop there, I think, might be the go. Okay, thank you very much, Cynthia.